thank you for your service. Let's start out with uh, the forest was prayer, which applies to collectors and chalice prayer as well. Bless, O Lord, those who minister in thy temple. We pray that what we speak with our lips, we may feel in our hearts, and what we feel in our hearts, we may show forth in our lives. To the glory of thy name. Amen. Amen. The choir says that every time it comes in, it's not a bad idea to think about that before you start the service, before everything gets busy in the process. So first and foremost, thank you for your interest in serving uh, the parish. We play a very important role, as you know, uh, working with uh, priests and deacons uh, in going through the entire service. And the ministries that you're participating in have long histories to them. So for example, if you look at uh, the Episcopal Church, it is a liturgical church, which means we have a following path, that customary that I mentioned before, basically is the order of service that we use. And we really break up the, uh, the service into two parts, the ordinary and the specific for the day. And so as a consequence, the lessons and the Gospels and the Old Testament readings that we do change throughout the year. There are actually a cycle of three of them that are approved uh, for the church to use. And they take us through the history and the progression of, of Christ's uh, ministry on earth. And at the same time, lay out many of the lessons that we need to know. We use a version where you usually find that the epistle and the Old Testament lesson are coordinated. And that's really to make a point that every Sunday there are certain aspects of, uh, of our life in Christ that we want to focus on as we go through. Let's deal with the uh, lectors first, and then afterwards we'll talk about child care in the process. If you look at lectors, uh, it's a role that goes all the way back to about uh, the 5th century before the birth of Christ. And if you look in the Bible under Nehemiah, you'll find that at a time when Israel was once had returned to its land, but was once again falling away from God, Nehemiah called everyone together uh, and priests came and they asked the Levites to read from the Torah to all the members of the community, to educate them on what was the covenant of the law that Moses had made with the people of Israel. And so this process of being a lector is a critical part because it gives voice to the readings on given day. And what you'll find is, is frequently, it's not always the gospel that is preached on, frequently the lessons that you read then become the subject of the sermon on Given Sunday and Holiday. And so as a consequence, the role of the lector is really to give voice to the Bible and to the lessons of the day. And so as you prepare and as you come to church in the process, there's a few things that we need to pay attention to. One is... You need to be able to enunciate clearly. Fortunately, the sound system works well enough in this that people can hear you in the back. Uh, you don't need to adjust the microphones. They're all set for variable height, so just you can come up and read. Um, and the pace at which you read is a comfortable reading. You don't have to exaggerate the words. You can be a little bit dramatic as you go through it, just to add emphasis especially when you're reading through a, a long list of biblical names in the process, it's usually a challenge. And there's one rule which we always use, there are only three people in the congregation who will know if you make a mistake on one of those names. And in that context, as good Christians, they might point it out to you afterwards, but it's not really the important part. Uh, so as you go through, should you want to know pronunciation, Back in the Vestal Sacristy, there is a book of names and phonetic pronunciations for just about every name that's in the Bible. So if you really feel unsure, there's always a reference. When all else fails, ask the verger. If he doesn't or she doesn't know, they'll ask the priest. If they don't know, we're real trouble. <laughs> it's the end of the line. But the truth of the matter is, the most important part is what meaning are you trying to convey to somebody? And about the pace that I'm talking now is probably about right. If you slow it down too much, then people can't really capture the meaning. And if you talk like a New Yorker, like my daughter who just called, you never even know what I'm saying. So as you run through it, just an easy pace, a comfortable pace, 
paying attention to pronunciation and particularly punctuation because I will tell you now, in my experience, letters from Paul, Paul was very good at a number of things. Run-on sentences is one of his favorite pieces. So making run-on sentence intelligible is probably a little bit of practice. So what that takes us to is you have on your sheet of paper, one of the sheets of paper I gave you, the five P's of preparing and enunciating and working through uh, a given reading in the process. All of our readings are available online under Preparing for Sunday. If you go to St. Mark's website, then go to Worship, you'll go down to Preparing for Sunday, and you'll see all the readings listed there. You should receive a copy electronically of the readings by email from the parish office, usually by Wednesday, Thursday of the week. That gives you the opportunity to read it through. I know with Suzanne and I, we always found, particularly Suzanne felt much more comfortable she read it out loud at least once. Uh, sometimes twice if it was more complicated in the process, just because it builds confidence. It's like being in school play and you just get an opportunity to get used to it. So the first part really is the preparation of it. The second part is the presentation, which we just discussed, which is clear, the punctuation, and emphasis on the points that it's trying to make. So as a lector, much like the Levites in days gone by, you're helping to interpret what that reading says by how you read it. We don't need uh, people to go and write their own preambles to it when you take a look at the Book of Lessons. We have an introduction and it basically is very simple. It's just a reading from the Book of Isaiah, the first one tomorrow morning, or a reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians, the second reading. And so as a consequence, uh, as you go through those, uh, that's all the introduction that you need. And at the end, you'll see either the Word of God in the book, or hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people, which is our bishop's favorite closing for the epistles. Pace we talked about. And then lastly, one of the things which is important is just breathe while you're reading. So that you're at ease, and that puts everybody else at ease in listening to it. It also helps you phrase things. The reason these periods, it's a little like the end of a comma, and the piece is a chance to catch your breath, just use it. And it works perfectly fine. So before the day's out, those who want will give you an opportunity to read using the, uh, the audio system so you can get a feel for what it's like. Uh, if you talk to me just this level, people could hear me in the back now. And if we use the audio system, uh, you'll see it's just about the same. The objective on the audio system is not to be booting out, uh, but more likely to overcome the fact that the more people you have, the more sound gets absorbed. So really, that really represents the key elements of being a lector. Uh, now, there are three different roles that are played as a lector. Uh, and as a lay reader, you could be asked to do any one of these. One of them is you could be uh, reading the lessons, and that could be the lector's role. You can also be the intercessor. The intercessor reads the prayers of people at each service. And it's the tradition in this church and in most Episcopal churches that the intercessions are read by a member of the congregation since they're the prayers of the people. If, if by any time that there's someone's not here who's supposed to read, the verge was responsible for asking a substitute. So you could be asked, would you be willing to read the, the prayers this morning for missing someone? And secondarily, if there's no one else available, uh, the verge herself or herself has the responsibility for filling any gaps that are there. That includes Charles Ferris, and for some reason they didn't come to the service that day. So let's talk a little bit about how to approach when we come up. Every time you are in the uh, sanctuary area and your hands are free, you're asked to reverence the altars you go by as the symbol of the home of the congregation and the holiest place in the church. That's where the consecration takes place. And so as you come up, you're asked to sit in the first few rows. You see that in the written instruction given, so that it doesn't take a long time for people to come up. Uh, if you need more time, you can start coming up during the previous activity, whether it's the reading of the psalm or whatever it is, uh, and come up, come to the altar, reverence, and then turn to the book. 
and you can read from the book. And so you can see here, for example, when you come up, it says a reading from the book of Isaiah, and it has Isaiah 65, 1 to 9. That should be the reading you got the night before if you're reading the Old Testament lesson. If you are reading at 8 o'clock, you do both readings preceding the Gospel. So both the, the Old Testament lesson and the Epistle. If you're reading at 10 o'clock, typically we have enough readers that we'll have one reader for the Old Testament lesson and one reader for the Epistle. And of course the Gospel is usually done by uh, one of the presbyters or a deacon in the process. When you finish your reading, the first reading at 8 o'clock, you may go and sit at one of the seats adjacent to the clergy. You should find a spare copy of the service leaflet there. And obviously between the Old Testament lesson and the, the epistle is the psalm. And so as, during the psalm, you can sit and read along. Uh, afterwards, come back up, do the second reading. And after that, wait for the priest to put the closing statement around your reading. At which point, you may reverence the altar and go back to your seat in the process. If it's 10 o'clock, after you finish your reading, just turn around, reverence the altar, and go down uh, to your seat in the process. So at 8 o'clock, two readings, you get to sit up here during the reading of the psalm. At 10 o'clock, after your reading, and after the closing statement, you can go back to your seat in the process. Really, uh, the most important part of that is understanding what it is you're reading in the first place. I sometimes find that if you look at the preparing for Sunday piece, it gives an explanation of the reading and why the reading was selected. And sometimes that just helps get your head around what is it that I'm trying to say with this. Particularly if Paul's been rambling on for a really long sentence. There is a meaning in there. You just have to figure it out sometimes. So really, when you think about it, either as a lay reader could be a lector and read one of the lessons, or it could be an intercessor and read all of that is sort of an introduction to the rest of the parish. You'll hear them flipping pages if it's on two sides of the page for them. The other point here is, as it stands right now in tomorrow's readings, what you'll find when you come up is that it won't affect you, but frequently the readings on the second page. The verger should have set the book up in advance, and if so, they'll leave a tab out for the other lessons so you can just turn it up to read the second lesson. The other thing you'll find in the book is the intercessions. So the prayers of the people. As we see here, this is the 8 o'clock version. Uh, there's a 10 o'clock version as well. Should, for some reason, the virgin not have changed it out when you come to check your readings in the morning, which I highly recommend, they are on top of the counter in the sacristy. So as a consequence, you should be able to find them. Anytime you have a question or a concern, uh, take it up with the verger. Uh, verger should be able to resolve it for you, not they'll find it resolve it for you. That's part of the job to make sure everybody has their what they need and it feels comfortable the process. So really that's pretty much what it takes to, to be a lector in the process. Uh, you'll also notice that there is a piece here on general movements in, in the uh, chancel and the sanctuary. The chancel is from here the circle, the circle is the sanctuary part. And basically, all we're asking, this is mostly written for the acolytes. You'll notice it says, don't swing your, your uh, sanctuary process, which is a favorite sort of idle mind thing that acolytes tend to do. So there's a couple of key points on this, and that is, what we'd like people to do when they come up is to convey a sense of the sanctity of what they're doing and the gravity of the moment. And so, uh, it's not that you have to be overly dramatic, but uh, paying attention to movement. Particularly uh, for the chalice bearers and the acolytes, you guys them not to cross their legs during service, and they're both feet flat on the floor. Um, and so there's a whole series of things that we put forward, mostly for the acolytes. I gave you a copy of it just for reference uh, in the process. Any questions on being a lector at this point before we go on? The last point I need to make to you is that we'd really like you to be here at least 15 and probably 20 minutes before service. And if you would, check in with whoever the version of the day is, you'll find the name back in the leaflet. Uh, our practice is to have the same version at 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock, so whichever leaflet you have to read should have the same name for both. 
and uh, that helps them know that they have no lectures in place and they don't need to go scrambling around just before service to see if there's a substitute. If you are a substitute for someone because there's a list you'll find on the website of everybody else who's a lector, uh, you can call the parish office and leave a note. If that change takes place before Wednesday, usually that means we'll change the service leaflet. If, in fact, it takes place afterwards, because things do happen periodically, uh, just let the verger know at the time, and they'll know not to look for ads if, if uh, Paul or somebody else is going to do the reading. So as a consequence, it's just a way to keep everybody on the same page as 